This is Chapter 49 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 49. An extract or two from the newspapers of the day will furnish a photograph that can need no embellishment. Fatal shooting affray. An affray occurred last evening in a billiard saloon on C Street between Deputy Marshal Jack Williams and William Brown, which resulted in the immediate death of the latter. There had been some difficulty between the parties for several months. An inquest was immediately held, and the following testimony adduced. Officer George Birdsell, sworn, says, I was told William Brown was drunk and was looking for Jack Williams. So soon as I heard that, I started for the parties to prevent a collision, went into the billiard saloon, saw Billy Brown running around, saying if anybody had anything against him to show cause, he was talking in a boisterous manner, and Officer Perry took him to the other end of the room to talk to him. Brown came back to me, remarked to me that he thought he was as good as anybody, and knew how to take care of himself. He passed by me and went to the bar. Don't know whether he drank or not. Williams was at the end of the billiard table, next to the stairway. Brown, after going to the bar, came back and said he was as good as any man in the world. He had then walked out to the end of the first billiard table from the bar. I moved closer to them, supposing there would be a fight. As Brown drew his pistol, I caught hold of it. He had fired one shot at Williams. Don't know the effect of it caught hold of him with one hand, and took hold of the pistol and turned it up. Think he fired once after I caught hold of the pistol. I wrenched the pistol from him, walked to the end of the billiard table, and told a party that I had Brown's pistol, and to stop shooting. I think four shots were fired in all. After walking out, Mr. Foster remarked that Brown was shot dead. Oh, there was no excitement about it. He merely remarked the small circumstance. Four months later the following item appeared in the same paper, the Enterprise. In this item, the name of one of the city officers above referred to, Deputy Marshal Jack Williams, occurs again. Robbery and Desperate Affray On Tuesday night a German named Charles Herzl, engineer in a mill at Silver City, came to this place, and visited the hurdy-gurdy house on B Street. The music, dancing, and Teutonic maidens awakened memories of Fatherland, until our German friend was carried away with rapture. He evidently had money, and was spending it freely. Late in the evening Jack Williams and Andy Blessington invited him downstairs to take a cup of coffee. William proposed a game of cards, and went upstairs to procure a deck, but not finding any, returned. On the stairway he met the German, and, drawing his pistol, knocked him down and rifled his pockets of some seventy dollars. Herzl dared give no alarm, as he was told, with a pistol at his head. If he made any noise or exposed them, they would blow his brains out. So effectually was he frightened that he made no complaint until his friends forced him. Yesterday a warrant was issued, but the culprits had disappeared. This efficient city officer, Jack Williams, had the common reputation of being a burglar, a highwayman, and a desperado. It was said that he had several times drawn his revolver and levied money contributions on citizens at dead of night in the public streets of Virginia. Five months after the above item appeared, Williams was assassinated while sitting at a card table one night. A gun was thrust through the crack of the door, and Williams dropped from his chair, riddled with balls. It was said, at the time, that Williams had been for some time aware that a party of his own sort, desperadoes, had sworn away his life, and it was generally believed among the people that Williams' friends and enemies would make the assassination memorable, and useful, too, by a wholesale destruction of each other. It did not so happen, but still times were not dull during the next twenty-four hours, for within that time a woman was killed by a pistol-shot, a man was brained with a slung-shot, and a man named Reeder was also disposed of permanently. Some matters in the Enterprise account of the killing of Reeder are worth noting, especially the accommodating complacence of a Virginia Justice of the Peace. The italics in the following narrative are mine. More cutting and shooting. The devil seems to have again broken loose in our town. Pistols and guns explode, and knives gleam in our streets, as in early times. When there has been a long season of quiet, people are slow to wet their hands in blood, 
but once blood is spilled, cutting and shooting come easy. Night before last Jack Williams was assassinated, and yesterday forenoon we had more bloody work, growing out of the killing of Williams, and on the same street in which he met his death. It appears that Tom Reeder, a friend of Williams, and George Gumbert were talking, at the meat market of the latter, about the killing of Williams the previous night, when Reeder said it was a most cowardly act to shoot a man in such a way, giving him no show. Gumbert said that Williams had as good a show as he gave Billy Brown, meaning the man killed by Williams last March. Reeder said it was a damned lie that Williams had no show at all. At this, Gumbert drew a knife and stabbed Reeder, cutting him in two places in the back. One stroke of the knife cut into the sleeve of Reeder's coat, and passed downward in a slanting direction through his clothing, and entered his body at the small of the back. Another blow struck more squarely, and made a much more dangerous wound. Gumbert gave himself up to the officers of justice, and was shortly after discharged by Justice Atwill, on his own recognizance, to appear for trial at six o'clock in the evening. In the meantime, Reeder had been taken into the office of Dr. Owens, where his wounds were properly dressed. One of his wounds was considered quite dangerous, and it was thought by many that it would prove fatal. But, being considerably under the influence of liquor, Reeder did not feel his wounds as he otherwise would, and he got up and went into the street. He went to the meat market and renewed his quarrel with Gumbert, threatening his life. Friends tried to interfere to put a stop to the quarrel and get the parties away from each other. In the fashion saloon, Reeder made threats against the life of Gumbert, saying he would kill him, and it is said that he requested the officers not to arrest Gumbert, as he intended to kill him. After these threats, Gumbert went off and procured a double-barreled shotgun, loaded with buckshot or revolver balls, and went after Reeder. Two or three persons were assisting him along the street, trying to get him home, and had him just in front of the store of Klopstock and Harris, when Gumbert came across toward him from the opposite side of the street with his gun. He came up within about ten or fifteen feet of Reeder, and called out to those with him to look out, get out of the way, and they had only time to heed the warning when he fired. Reeder was at the time attempting to screen himself behind a large cask, which stood against the awning post of Klopstock and Harris's store, but some of the balls took effect in the lower part of his breast, and he reeled around forward and fell in front of the cask. Gumbert then raised his gun and fired the second barrel, which missed Reeder and entered the ground. At the time that this occurred, there were a great many persons on the street in the vicinity, and a number of them called out to Gumbert when they saw him raise his gun to, "'Hold on!' and, "'Don't shoot!' The cutting took place about ten o'clock, and the shooting about twelve. After the shooting the street was instantly crowded with the inhabitants of that part of the town, some appearing much excited and laughing, declaring that it looked like the good old times of sixty. Marshal Perry and Officer Birdsell were near when the shooting occurred, and Gumbert was immediately arrested and his gun taken from him when he was marched off to jail. Many persons who were attracted to the spot where this bloody work had just taken place looked bewildered, and seemed to be asking themselves what was to happen next, appearing in doubt as to whether the killing mania had reached its climax, or whether we were to turn in and have a grand killing spell, shooting whoever might have given us offence. It was whispered around that it was not all over yet. Five or six more were to be killed before night. Reeder was taken to the Virginia City Hotel, and doctors called in to examine his wounds. They found that two or three balls had entered his right side. One of them appeared to have passed through the substance of the lungs, while another passed into the liver. Two balls were also found to have struck one of his legs. As some of the balls struck the cask, the wounds in the Reeder's leg were probably from these, glancing downward, so they might have been caused by the second shot fired. After being shot, Reeder said, when he got on his feet, smiling as he spoke, "'It will take better shooting than that to kill me.' The doctors consider it almost impossible for him to recover, but as he has an excellent constitution he may survive, notwithstanding the number and dangerous character of the wounds he has received. The town appears to be perfectly quiet at present, as though the late stormy times had cleared our moral atmosphere. But who can tell in what quarter clouds are lowering or plots ripening. Reader, or at least what was left of him, survived his wounds two days. Nothing was ever done with Gumbert. Trial by jury is the palladium of our liberties. 
I do not know what a palladium is, having never seen a palladium, but it is a good thing, no doubt, at any rate. Not less than a hundred men have been murdered in Nevada. Perhaps I would be within bounds if I said three hundred, and as far as I can learn only two persons have suffered the death penalty there. However, four or five who had no money and no political influence have been punished by imprisonment. One languished in prison as much as eight months, I think. However, I do not desire to be extravagant. It may have been less. However, one prophecy was verified at any rate. It was asserted by the desperados that one of their brethren, Joe McGee, a special policeman, was known to be the conspirator chosen by lot to assassinate Williams, and they also asserted that doom had been pronounced against McGee, and that he would be assassinated in exactly the same manner that had been adopted for the destruction of Williams, a prophecy which came true a year later. After twelve months of distress, for McGee saw a fancied assassin in every man that approached him, he made the last of many efforts to get out of the country unwatched. He went to Carson and sat down in a saloon to wait for the stage. It would leave at four in the morning. But as the night waned and the crowd thinned, he grew uneasy, and told the barkeeper that assassins were on his track. The barkeeper told him to stay in the middle of the room then, and not go near the door, or the window by the stove but a fatal fascination seduced him to the neighborhood of the stove every now and then, and repeatedly the barkeeper brought him back to the middle of the room and warned him to remain there. But he could not. At three in the morning he again returned to the stove and sat down by a stranger. Before the barkeeper could get to him with another warning whisper, someone outside fired through the window and riddled McGee's breast with slugs, killing him almost instantly. By the same discharge, the stranger at McGee's side also received attentions which proved fatal in the course of two or three days. End of chapter 49